just because you're holding the world championship does that mean you're actually the best in the world it might seem pretty contradictory but don't blame me because that's often been the attitude of you lot the fan base on multiple occasions maybe they won it in a controversial way maybe their first title defense was against someone who it didn't seem like they had a chance of beating or maybe they were defending against a fighter they'd already lost to before believe it or not on multiple occasions there have been mma world champions who everyone thought was actually gonna lose almost immediately but instead proved everyone wrong. I'm Bailey and from MMA On Point, got to give a shout out to the Channel Hall of Famers who support our content every single week. And these are 10 champs who expected to fail but didn't. Number 10, Jake Shields versus Dan Henderson. If you're a newer fan, you might have heard of Jake Shields, especially because he's on MMA Twitter a lot these days. But even if you saw his UFC career, you might not know much about what happened before all that. After joining the Japanese pro MMA circuit in Pancras and Shuto, Jake managed to win the Shuto Welterweight Championship in 2004. After that, he took on the likes of Yushin Okami and Carlos Condit in Rumble on the Rock and guys like Paul Daly and Mike Pyle in Elite XC before eventually making it to Strike Force, riding a 10-fight win streak. He beat Robbie Lawler in his debut and then won the vacant Strike Force middleweight title in a heated rivalry with Jason Miller. Still, even all that didn't give fans much confidence in his chances when it was announced Dan Henderson, coming off of the back of the KO of the year against Mike Bisping, would be heading to Strike Force to challenge the champion Jake Shields. Most people thought Jake was pretty damn good, but Dan had won two titles in Pride only three years ago, had left the UFC on a three-fight win streak, and Jake hadn't even competed in the UFC yet. Many people doubted Shields in that fight, but after getting dropped and rocked early... He pulled out the decision victory against Henderson. First round, he beat the crab bat. What can I say? It's hard for him to hit my life. I was after the first minute. I didn't know where I was. I was just uh, fighting on heart. And then, of course, all hell broke loose. But that had nothing to do with Dan. Number nine, Vadim Nemkov versus Corey Anderson 2. Deciding he'd had enough of the UFC, Corey Anderson left for Bellator, and after a stellar TKO in his debut against Melvin Manhoof, he entered into the light heavyweight Grand Prix, where he got another TKO in the first round, then knocking out the heavyweight champion Ryan Bader in just 60 seconds. It was a pretty good entrance into Bellator. Corey now had only lost once in his last eight fights, and he was going to fight for the light heavyweight championship against Vadim Nemkov. If you don't know the current Bellator champ Vadim, he's a four-time combat Sambo world champion, a protege of Fedor Emelianenko, and he's still ranked number one on Sherdog's light heavyweight rankings. His first fight with Corey Anderson at the end of the Grand Prix was also for a million dollars and it pretty much went as Corey had predicted. After an even start, he started piecing him up in the second and third rounds and landing heavy ground and pound. But the fight came to an end early because of a clash of heads. It was declared a no contest and the tournament had no winner, but given his performance, Corey thought he was the new champion. I'm the motherfucking champ! Of course, they booked the rematch and people thought the fight was about to go pretty much the same. Corey was as much as a minus 230 favorite and he seemed destined like Bader and Davis before him to win a belt coming over from the UFC. But the rematch was not the same fight at all. I mean, Vadim dropped him with a wheel kick in the first round. Department of the first round for the... Oh! Nemkov remained the champion and now he's turned back four former top five UFC fighters. Number eight, Leon Edwards versus Kamaru Usman three. Given that it took the best part of three years for Leon Edwards to actually be given his title shot after doing all he could to earn it, it is a little concerning he's now looking for champ champ fights instead of kind of giving those same opportunities to the contenders and the place he was in. There's no one that's like exciting in the division now, so for me to go out there and um, to do that, that would, that would be perfect. So the point also is, when he finally got his chance to fight for the belt, he absolutely capitalised on it. He knocked out the champion and went from being discussed as the most boring fighter to one you can absolutely never count out until the final belt. But many fans still had their doubts that he would stay champion long considering Kamaru Usman was winning 24 minutes of that fight. So when the rematch was booked, it was a foregone conclusion for a lot of people that Leon would lose. Not everyone, of course, but it was definitely a possibility, especially given how dominant Usman had been as the champion. But no, Leon fought with a renewed confidence and shut the former champion down every single step of the way. Number seven, Charles Oliveira. Do you remember that brief period in UFC lightweight history where Habib had already retired and everyone thought Dustin Poirier was a champion by default because he'd already beaten everyone else? And then he went and had those two fights with Conor instead of fighting for the title and out of nowhere, Charles Oliveira was the new champion. It kind of felt like no one had seen it coming when he won the vacant title by beating Michael Chandler. He had come back from the brink of defeat and that was something a lot of fans had sometimes questioned about him, his will to fight. Some people thought if it got tough, he would just quit and he proved them wrong in that one. 
Then he took on the guy everyone thought was the champion, Dustin. Dustin was the betting favourite going into the fight and the Bronx finished him in the third round. And if that wasn't enough, he also then beat the third member of that triple threat at lightweight, Justin Gaethje, and choked him out in the first round. Charles went from a journeyman UFC staple to basically two-time defending champion with 20 finishes in the UFC, and he's only lost to one man in the last six years. I don't know how we could ever have doubted him, to be honest. Charles Oliveira, a big champion. The champion is the name. The Charles Oliveira, brother. Number six, Sergio Pettis. It's obviously always going to be hard to escape the shadow of an older brother in any sport. I mean, look at the Diaz brothers. It took years for Nate to establish his own legacy. And it's going to be hard when your brother was a WEC and UFC lightweight champion and had one of the most entertaining styles of all time. Sergio definitely entered the UFC under a spotlight and you could tell the promotion wanted to get him to the top quickly because they gave him Alex Caceres in just his second UFC fight. Alex was on a four fight unbeaten streak in that division and that was Sergio's first loss. And after 13 more UFC fights, he was eight and five. The younger Pettis had had some great performances, but he wasn't able to get past the very best to fight for a title like his big brother. In 2019, Sergio tested free agency and landed himself in Bellator, and after just two wins, he fought Juan Archuleta for the title. Archuleta was a force. He'd just beaten the undefeated Patchy Mix, and Juan's only loss in his last 21 fights was at featherweight to the champion. He was the favorite, but Sergio surprised a few people when he beat him and took the title. But up next was the absolute monster Kyoji Horiguchi as a part of a Bellator Rising crossover. After losing to Demetrius Johnson, Horiguchi had gone on a 13-fight win streak with only a slight stumble in a wild fight with Kai Asakura. People thought for the first time someone like Horiguchi was about to lay claim to two titles in two separate promotions, and he was winning the fight until the fourth round where Sergio pulled off a knockout of the year. <laughs> But as if that wasn't enough, Sergio's next defense was against Patricio Pitbull, the scariest man in Bellator history, a guy who had won the lightweight title, the featherweight title, three times and was coming to try and be the first man ever to win three titles in three different weight classes. For a third time in a row, Sergio was the underdog, but he used his speed to outwork the bigger man and has truly built a legacy of his own, even if he did just lose his title. Number five, Jens Pulver vs. BJ Penn won. A big reason the UFC decided to make a lightweight title in the first place was because of guys like BJ Penn. When Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu makes the UFC what it is, having the first and only American to ever win the World Championships join your promotion and then knock out two people in the first round is probably going to have you wanting to invest in the rest of the division. The first title fight a lightweight though was between Carl Uno, who was at the time the Shuto welterweight champion, which was actually 155 pounds anyway, and Jens Pulver, whose 11 second KO of John Lewis at UFC 28 was also probably another reason the UFC were finally like, okay, fuck it, let's just get a belt in this weight class. Despite winning the fight against Uno and then defending against Dennis Hallman, a man that had beaten the welterweight champ Matt Hughes twice, people weren't convinced that Pulver could be the guy to stop the surging Hawaiian prodigy. To be fair, not only had BJ won impressively, but he had KO'd Dean Thomas, who had been 12-1 and and only ever lost to Carl Uno himself. I mean, Dean even had a win over the champion Pulver just a year before, then BJ also KO'd the former challenger Uno in just 10 seconds. There is a definite experience factor for Uno. There's and it had taken Jens all five rounds to deal with him. Jens had been great, but everyone thought BJ was the next big thing and was supposed to win that belt. But Little Evil shocked everyone, even himself a bit, I think, when he pulled off the majority decision against the Prodigy. Number four, Brock Lesnar. To be honest, I think there were two camps when the Beast Incarnate announced he'd be swapping the pro wrestling speedos for some MMA shorts. One that said, oh shit, the suplex machine is going to the UFC to throw people around the cage. And the other that were more like, oh God, no, why is the pro wrestler signing up to get himself killed? by the scariest man on the planet. Obviously, Brock actually had a pretty good base for MMA. He had been a Division I college wrestling champion, but in terms of experience, well, he had none. He lost his UFC debut to Frank Mir, but still eventually won the heavyweight title after he TKO'd Randy Couture. Point of round two. Heavyweight title oh, on the line. Randy got Couture hurt. is down. Now, that was crazy enough, but then to think he'd actually go on and defend it as the champion, that was a whole other basket of muffins. Many people thought he wouldn't have the belt for long, especially since his first defense would be against Frank Mir the guy he'd already lost to, but they headlined UFC 100 and Lesnar showed everyone that he was pretty much here to stay, finishing Frank in the second round. If there were doubts about him beating Frank, though, there were even more about the possibility of being the first man on the planet to stop the juggernaut Shane Carwin. And for most of the fight, Brock was just getting hammered by thunderous ground and pound, but he was the only man ever to survive longer than a round at that point and tapped him in the second. In the mixed martial arts world, oh, he tapped! It is all over! It is all over! 
Even when compared to just the joke a lot of people thought he was going to be when he joined the UFC, I'd say he did pretty damn well for himself. Number 3. Frankie Edgar vs BJ Penn 2 Everyone's favorite wise guy, New Jersey native Frankie Edgar, got a lot of MMA fans quickly by being a sort of rocky character in the UFC. Undersized and outgunned, but still able to win. He did lose along the way though, like his fight against Gray Maynard. There were two undefeated lightweight prospects, but he had some great performances afterwards, like his fight the night finish over Matt Veach that saw him be the one to face BJ Penn for the UFC title. But guys, BJ had just set the record for most lightweight defenses. After all the things he'd already done in his UFC career, this was prime BJ. He'd finally found his home and it was as the UFC champion. Controversially, Frankie stepped in and took the belt away from the seemingly invincible Penn. So going into the rematch, people thought BJ would come back better, that he would right the wrongs of the first fight and reinstate himself as a champion. People just didn't see Frankie Edgar as the new champ. But the second fight was not even that close. Edgar won every single round and there was no doubt he was the new guy. And still! It was just something people were going to have to get used to and he continued to prove people wrong by defending the belt twice more after becoming the champion. Many fans doubted he even deserve to be in the first place. Number two, Adriano Moraes versus Demetrius Johnson. There's absolutely nothing deniable about the legacy of Demetrius Johnson. He has the most title defenses in the UFC and most of them were extremely dominant. And considering all that, I'm not sure many people saw him being traded to one for Ben Askren coming. It was a pretty interesting move after just one loss, a split decision against Henry Zahudo that cost him his title. The best ever flyweight was going to another promotion and he didn't even get an immediate title shot. He joined the Grand Prix and had to beat three dudes in 2019 to get a shot at the champion. But then he had to wait until the pandemic had ended before he could actually actually fight against Marais. Even though we hadn't seen the Mighty Mouse in two years, absolutely everyone thought he was going to be Adriano and become the new one champion. Marais was a great champ, but he'd been beaten before. But right when he thought he was going to lose, he KO'd DJ Cold in the second round and defended his title. Position now for the champion. Throws it near the door. DJ's hurt. It's good night, Irene. In the rematch, Demetrius returned the favor, but Marais proved that flyweights in one were just as dangerous as those in the UFC. Number 1. Aljamain Sterling vs Pyotr Jan 2 Well, if you were following the Funk Masters UFC career from the beginning, you'll know it was kind of always believed he'd fight for the title at some point. After just his first four UFC fights, believe it or not, Aljo was already ranked fourth in the division and basically in line for a title shot. I could see the belt right there in front of my sight, and all I had to do was just get past a couple more obstacles and it's right there, so I'm just taking this one fight at a time. But that's when he had setback losses, both by split decision against Brian Caraway and Rafael Asuncao. And so it would be another five years before he'd actually get to fight for the belt, which is like... A normal amount of time, not the fast track lane he'd been promised. And when we got to the title shot, he had to face probably one of the scariest bantamweight champions ever in Pierre de Yarn, who'd never lost in the UFC and had just battered Jose Aldo. And in their fight, he was just throwing Aldo around until he decided to illegally knee him, which resulted in disqualification and a new undisputed champion. That Stop! Wait, that's illegal. The problem was it was very much disputed. Of course, the rematch was booked, but considering how the first fight had gone, everyone expected Aljo to lose. It was still a fairly even fight, but the Funkmaster controlled large portions of it and surprised everyone, taking home a split victory. But even then, people didn't think it would last. He faced the former champ TJ, who a lot of people thought had the overall better MMA game, but he was far too injured to make it a fair fight. And even as Henry Cejudo returned to the division, a lot of people thought Aljo was finally going to lose, but he proved them wrong once again. All right, guys, what do you think of that? A bunch of these champions who exceeded your expectations, okay? You all thought they were going to lose, but they didn't. That's why they're world champions, and that's why we just sit here and watch them, because we're pathetic, aren't we? We're useless. Exactly. Big shout-out to George Hutchinson. He edited this video. You can go check him out on social media. Thank you, George, bringing you some entertainment and stuff. Give him a thank you. Go check out his stuff. As always, give a shout-out to those channel champions. Thank you very much, guys, for supporting the content. They're members here on the MMA on Point channel. You can join them. Links in the descriptions or click the box below. Find out what it's about becoming a channel member here. If you enjoyed the video, a thumbs up is always appreciated. And you can give us a subscribe if you're not. Don't know why you're not. Join the fam. We do loads of videos every single week. It's all right there for you taken. Is there anyone I missed out on this one? You let me know, okay? Maybe some of these champions you didn't expect to fail. Maybe you just knew more than us, but leave a comment down below. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks very much for watching. Goodbye.